Um, I'm Helen Worthington, and I'm coordinating editor, which is like editor-in-chief of the Cochrane Oral Health Group, and I spend my life doing systematic review, so. <laughs> um, and the Cochrane methodology, as you'll probably realise, is the sort of, it's where the methods are being developed and where the methods for systematic reviews come from, and anyway, you'll see. Oh, oh well, I don't want that one off, let's see. Right, okay, so I'm going to start with this. This was the headline in the Daily Telegraph in 2008. Um, apart from the two most important men in the Western world at the time, on the page was this, vitamin pills can increase the risk of early death. This is just to give you a flavour of what systematic reviews are about and how powerful they are. Um, they're often on the front page of the, of the papers, the main paper. Um, one of the reviews that I was involved with was on um, manual versus powered toothbrushing, and that was the front page of the, the Observer, that was front page of the Observer in about 2005, I think. So they're quite useful, valuable things. Um, so this review on vitamin pills was published um, on the Cochrane Library, and um, I've actually got the abstract here. There were 67 randomised trials with a quarter of a million people included in the review. And apart from really showing that vitamin pills um, as a supplement weren't really terribly useful, they also showed actually there was an increased risk of early death um, with the pills. Okay, so then we got the usual, um, all the celebrities saying, but I take them and I'm so well and this can't be right. And um, they were saying things like, but there were 10 times as many trials identified. Why did they only go down to 69? What happened to the others? How much bias there must be in there? Um, and these were people like, Sir Cliff Richards and um, I've got names here of anyway um, Jenny Seagrove and people like that um, who commented on this and then there was a column in the um, on the Bad Science website which is um, he's a columnist a science correspondent col columnist called Ben Goldacre who writes for the Guardian and he writes a very entertaining funny column that's always worth looking at um, and he picked it up and he was saying what a load of rubbish all this celebrity stuff is. Um, and, you know, he obviously enjoyed the Cochrane Review and always puts in a good word for us. He's always very pleased with what we do. Um, so this was the review that was based on. It's a Cochrane systematic review published on the library. Um, and we do try and keep these updated. I mean, one of the criticisms of the, of the vitamin review was that... Um, it had, it had been redone because of all the errors in the earlier version. Well, that was total rubbish because the whole policy is that we can keep things up to date and we're always redoing all our reviews. We're supposed to redo them every two years so that they're always up to date. So this is just to give you an idea of what Cochrane, well, what systematic reviews are about. And they don't have to be Cochrane reviews, but because the methodology is very good, it's a good place to start. Um, Although there's also the Campbell collaboration, which for some of you might be more useful. And that, that those are reviews that are outside medicine. So they're more for, to do with, um, I don't know, social work or prisons or other, other aspects of life apart from just health. Whereas Cochrane is, tends to be to do with health. Um, okay, so if you do, I could do with a pointer, I should have brought one. If you do a Wikipedia, sorry, a Google systematic review in the search line there. Um, what do we get? We get the Wikipedia definition, which is probably very similar to the one I'm going to give you. Um, but you can see how popular systematic reviewing is and how many people are involved in systematic reviewing. And notice that the Wikipedia one, straight away you're into the Cochrane um, method methodology, um, into the Cochrane reviews. Um, that was just to sort of set the scene. Right, we're going to step back now. Um, suppose you want to find the best evidence for something. Suppose you're interested in finding out, I'm going to show you an example later on, does flossing, is it worthwhile flossing your teeth? I mean, for young people like you, you don't need to, but people like me, it might be something that might be helpful um, to stop my gums bleeding or my teeth falling out when I get old or older. Um, so where would I find the best evidence to find that? Um, the problem is there are so many articles being published every year now. Um, and... Also, not everything's published. We've got unpublished studies. And not everything's published in English. It can be published in languages across the world. So it's quite difficult to actually begin to look at what the evidence is. I mean, you might find the odd paper, 
But is that paper the same as other papers? Is, are the results of that study the same as others? We don't know. Um, the other thing you can do is you can look at things that are written by experts in textbooks and things. The problem with those is that they're quickly out of date. And the experts very often have a sort of axe to grind or and bias gets in there about what they're saying. So they aren't necessarily saying what the best evidence is. It's in their eyes what they think you should be doing with your patients. Sorry, am I walking up? Can you see? <laughs> do apologise, I'm a bit. So you can ask someone. I could ask my dentist, should I be flossing my teeth? What do you think? Um, look in the filing cabinet. You might have put an odd paper in there from somewhere. You could begin to search electronic databases such as Medline, Embase, Lilacs. Lilacs is the um, South American database like Embe, um, like Medline, um, with all the South Because a lot, lot of research done, set, certainly in dentistry anyway, in, um, in South America. Um, or you could begin to look at soft secondary publications such as Cochrane. Um, electronic databases, that's, that sounds as though it would be a very good idea. Um, this, is, this probably needs updating, but if you're looking for randomised controlled trials, at one stage, you only identify about 50%. Um, although they might be on Medline, not everything is on Medline, but although they probably are on Medline, the indexing is poor. You're looking at title abstracts and keywords. Um, and in the past, there weren't necessarily structured abstracts with everything, which made it more difficult to search and find things. And a lot of stuff on Medline hasn't got abstracts attached to it, so you're not searching the abstract. So really, if you actually, you wanted to try and find everything there was before you made your mind up about whether or not flossing was worth doing, um, the only reliable way, really, is to hand search through all the journals. So you'd have to decide which journals are important, and you'd have to hand search the journals. And I've actually done some hand searching. It's very boring, and it's tedious, and time consuming. Um, and we must try to avoid duplication of effort. There's no point in me doing it and then somebody else doing the same thing a month later. So um, Cochrane actually uh, tries to address that as part of our methods. Okay, so one problem, one solution to this problem um, is using systematic reviews of the evidence. So that's, that's why um, we, we use systematic reviews. Obviously, going back in time, they're a new thing because we couldn't do all this electronic searching and stuff. And it used to take you hours to find one paper in the library and you have to take your torch down into a basement somewhere and go through dusty things to try and find that one paper. But life's got much easier for students these days, hasn't it? You can almost just get them on your computer straight away. I mean, it's fantastic, the changes. And it, it, it does make systematic reviewing a lot easier than it was. So definition, formal definition, systematic review is the process of systematically locating, appraising and synthesising evidence from scientific studies in order to obtain a reliable overview. There's a, there's a problem with terminology. Um, the Americans call a systematic review a meta-analysis. So they think the whole systematic review, and they call it a meta-analysis. So there has been, but in Europe, we call it a systematic review, and the meta-analysis is the pooling of the data. It's actually the statistical analysis bit. And I'm only going to touch on that today. I'm going to talk more generally about the systematic review and the methods. Um, so there's slight problems in terminology. The Cochrane and the most of the rest of the world, really, use the definitions that I'm talking about. The systematic review is the whole collection of it's searching for the papers, appraising all the papers, putting everything together, synthesising it, and then trying to draw some conclusions from it. That's systematic review, including maybe a pooling of the results in a meta-analysis. Um, but, and the meta-analysis is actually that forest plotty bit and heterogeneity and stuff around that. I'm a mathematician by background, so that's the bit I enjoy. But um, you don't have to have a meta-analysis to have a systematic review. Okay. So, now I think that, certainly, I don't know about in your areas of the, of the universe, but I think most people's reviews of literature these days should be systematic. I actually think the university should make that. It's not up to me. If you're doing a PhD, I think you should be doing a systematic review um, in your area. Or at least have a look whether there are any that you can use in your um, introduction and review the discussion. Okay, traditional reviews, there were opinions based on haphazardly selected data rather than a comprehensive systematic assessment. I mean, when I did my PhD or master's many years ago, um, 
it would be impossible really to try and do what we now now can do so easily. You know, you, you, you would only have a small number of the pages because you couldn't, there was no way of finding them. Um, anyway, um, it's inconsistent, it's prone to error and unconvincing. A systematic review, you conduct it as you would do a, a scientific study. And we do it very carefully, just like a piece of primary research. We describe how we're going to, I mean, in my area, I'm looking for trials, um, usually, not always, but usually looking for randomised controlled trials. But you might not be. It might be some other level of evidence. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, how are you going to select these papers? What are you going to search? And then what are you going to do with them when you get them? And everything's checked and verified. One person can't do a systematic review. It has to be at least two people because everything is done in duplicate. And then you compare um, your results. So why are they important? They reduce quantity large quantities of information into manageable portions. They formulate policy and develop guidelines. Uh, NICE, uh, the Cochrane Systematic Reviews are the first place that NICE look um, when they're doing a guideline, one of their guidelines. Um, so they're very important. You know, the NHS only fund things that NICE approve, and NICE look to Cochrane first at the Systematic Review to decide what should be funded in the, in the UK um, in terms of drugs, in terms of operations that should be done, in terms of treatment of patients, etc., under the NHS. Um, so that, so it's, they're quite important. Um, it's important that we have an efficient use of resources. They increase the power and precision. If you can put lots of the results of lots of studies together and pool that and come out with an overall estimate, then you've got a far more powerful estimate of actually what the answer is. Um, and because it's done very carefully at each stage, we're thinking about bias and how it might be introduced. We try and limit the bias and improve the accuracy of the effect estimates or what you're trying to do um, in the review. Now, this is going to be the most complicated thing I talk about today. And somebody said to me, it's far too complicated, you can't possibly use that. But I find it quite a powerful example. So I'm going to do it very, very slowly. Um, this is an old paper. Um, an old system, well, it's, it's not a systematic review, you'll see in a minute. Um, and it's to do with the treatment of people who've had heart attacks. <coughs> and the treatment is to do with clock busters. If you just think of it as a clock buster, a buster so that it's, it's not aspirin, but it's like that. It's trying to thin the blood, so you're not going to have another heart attack. <laughs> That's the treatment. Um, and this paper looks at recommendations in textbooks and reviews. Um, and the results of a meta-analysis. Right. I'm going to take you through it very slowly. Don't be frightened. Right. What we have here, I wish I got a pointer, is this is called a cumulative uh, meta-analysis. And I'll explain, explain it very slowly so you're going to understand. You don't even need to know what's an odds ratio. The odds ratio is this blobby thing here. And that line there is the confidence interval for the odds ratio. If it crosses this line here, it means it's not statistically significant. If it doesn't cross this line here, it means it's statistically significant that way. So what we had, we had in, a, in the late 50s, we had one trial looking at these clock busters versus not giving them to people who've just had a heart attack. And in that trial, there were 23 patients and the results were inconclusive because the confidence interval is crossing the, the line of no difference. This is cumulative, so by the early 60s, there were two trials, and we've now got 85 patients, we're adding them together, and once again, we've got the same picture, we've got, um, although we've got a small odds ratio, it's crossing the line of no difference, so we, we, we don't know, we don't know whether this, whether these clock busters work or not. And well, when we get into the sort of, um, into the, about 1973, by then we've got 10 trials, and we've got 2,500 people who've been randomised into having these clock busters after having their heart attack or not. And actually, by now, the evidence is stacking up a bit. And we've got a confidence interval that doesn't cross our line. So we can actually say we're fairly confident that these clock busters work. They actually save lives. We're looking at, at saving lives here. This is all to do with saving lives. And... With time, more and more of these studies have been carried out, more and more of these trials, 
until we get to the 1990s, and there have been 70 trials now, and there have been 48,000 people randomised in these trials. So 24,000 of them weren't getting these clock busters. They were getting nothing. And it's a very, very strong result showing that this clock buster is very effective at stopping them dying, preventing death. So it's really important. And the p value is going up, and that we're more and more and more sure of the result. Right, so from about 1972, there was a clear cut result on that. We'll now have a look what happens in the textbook recommendations and, and the reviews that were carried out, which were the traditional sorts of reviews. I'll move back. Can you see? Okay. Okay, so not mentioned, which is probably what you'd expect there, not mentioned, experimental. One textbook or review. Now, this should get a bit more interesting now because now we've gone past where there's a de definitive result. We're actually saying it works now. Oh, there's one there, specific. It's saying it might be a good idea to use on patients, but 12 are still saying, well, they're not mentioning them at all. When, you, when you're looking at the care of people who've just had a heart attack, they're not mentioned still. Um, So you're seeing it's taking a long time for the evidence that we're probably hearing about 73. It's taking a long time for that evidence to get through to people, for them to actually take on board. Now, the problem was, of course, meta-analysis wasn't done um, because you couldn't really do one. We can do, we can retrospectively do them now, but you couldn't do one. So it's taken a long time for this to be known to the medical community. <laughs> um, but can you see the power of this? We could have, there, we could have told the world that it's definitely worth using these, and it would have stopped the difference here, which is um, 46,000, 45,000 people, half of that, so it would be 23,000 people who weren't given anything, who would have had a lot better chance of not dying had they had the clock busted. So I think it's quite a powerful example of why a meta-analysis as part of a systematic review is quite a useful um, tool. Okay, so from that, there were discrepancies between the meta-analyses and recommendations by reviewers, as we saw by the people in the textbooks and the reviewers in the last column. Um, the review articles failed to mention important new advances and delayed recommending effective preventive measures and harmful treatments continued to be recommended by experts for years, almost 20 years. They were still recommending, not recommending using these clock busters, which are now standard practice for people who've had a heart attack. Um, you would try and get them on some sort of blood thinning agent or clock buster, sorry, um, very quickly. So, systematic review process, um, it's very structured, and you, to begin with, you write a protocol. Um, so it's like a, a primary research study. You write a very detailed protocol and you discuss everything endlessly and get it all sorted out. And then after that, any protocol changes, you have to say why you've made that change. To try and avoid bias, it's very easy to be drawn into things um, when you know the answer, when you know that actually there's a difference here between old people and young people. It's very easy to be to put too much weight on that post heart rather than a prior. Okay, so what we've got, first of all, we have to have a well-formulated question. Now, I'll talk to you a little bit about that. Then you do a very comprehensive data search um, of not just electronic databases, and we'll go through what you need to search. There's then an unbiased selection and abstraction process from the papers. Often that's all you've got is what's published, so it's reported. Or maybe you've got from a drug company some unpublished stuff. Um, and there are... Fascinating stories about that. That's, that's, I have time to talk about that. Um, the paper has to be assessed, and then there's a synthesis of the data, and then you have to come try and synthesize the findings and come up with some conclusions from the review. Um, I was just thinking about the flossing example. I was trying to think of an example that you might understand. I think most of you won't be interested in flossing because of part of your but anyway, how effective is flossing in addition to toothbrushing? as compared with toothbrushing alone in the management of bleeding gums and tooth decay? That is the sort of question that you might be thinking about. 
So you start with a question, and then we begin to think about PICO. Um, so if we're thinking about a systematic review, what sort of participants do we want in that review? What sort of interventions? <coughs> what are those interventions compared to? And what outcomes are we measuring? The question is very important, Titch. The linchpin of the systematic review protocol, it leads on to the inclusion and exclusion criteria. It helps to build up the search strategy because you're beginning to know what terms should be going in there and what you're excluding. Um, it gets the authors of the review to think about what data to extract and what quality criteria are important in this review. And it allows the authors to decide on their analysis now. That's more of a Cochrane thing. Um, you don't need to worry too much about that today. Um, so in the example that I gave, um, I was just quickly yesterday trying to think of what you might be thinking about. Um, would you have all ages in it? Would you have children in it? Probably not. Um, would you have people with restricted dexterity if we're interested in flossing? Are we just using people who can do it? Who might? might. Um, what about orthodontic patients with the bands on? Orthodontic bands. Anyway, those are all issues you'd have to think about whether or not you wanted those patients in the review or not. Uh, would it just be people who do it themselves at home as part of their routine practice? Or would it be something where you'd want it supervised? You know, in a clinic, would you want to supervise people and then have a look whether they could help themselves under supervision? Um, would you include studies where the people were also mouth rinsing with chlorhexidine or something like that? Um, so the comparisons could be toothbrushing should be without flossing. So we could be comparing toothbrushing with flossing with toothbrushing without flossing. And we could randomise people to those two groups. That would be the sort of trial that you might want to include in this. What would we do if there was also rinsing in both those groups? Would that, would that sort of affect things or not? Would we, would we still want those studies? And then the outcomes, what are we going to measure at the end in, in these studies? What, what are we hoping the studies are measuring? Um, and I just put some things like number of bleeding sites. Um, I mean, it could be the amount of caries, as we said. Are there any side effects? Um, can you damage any damage you can do um, to your teeth by using floss? Um, and what's the cost of it? How much does it cost? So these are all things that you need to think about when you are designing a systematic review. Um, this is just the evidence table. If any of you have been involved in scientific research, you probably know this. Um, so we've got randomised control trials, and actually above that could be systematic reviews of randomised control trials, might sit above that. Then you've got randomised control trials. You've got cohort studies, case control, cross-sectional. These are getting weaker and weaker. Case series or case reports, and bottom of the whole lot is expert opinion. And that actually expert opinion is how people used to teach and still do um, medicine and this sort of stuff. So it's expert opinion. And now these methods of doing systematic reviews and using the findings of those to teach students is how everything should be. And that's coming into the curriculum of all, certainly the dental school, the medical school, but the, it should all be evidence-based. Everything that they're taught to do, it should be evidence-based. So that's the hierarchy of evidence. Another example to keep you awake, um, this is actually a meta-analysis, it's just an interesting example. We've just done the levels of evidence and randomised controlled trials, RCTs were at the top. Just below that was something called cohort studies. Um, this is a quite a, an interesting example just to entertain you. Um, it's looking at beta-carotene intake, so that's when people eat very healthily, so we're eating <coughs> salad -y, carrot -y type things or they're having a supplement, um, and whether you die of a heart attack, let's say, very simply. What we have here is we have a meta-analysis that has two subgroups. The first subgroup are, and what we're looking at is looking at large studies and we're looking at risk of death. So the, the top part are the cohort studies. So these were cohort studies where we just observed people and it was specific groups of people, and you were looking at people who had <coughs> lots of beta carotene in their diet and people who didn't, and you will be comparing them. And what the, the 
top studies here show is that it's really good. It really works really well. If you've got beta carotene in your diet, you're healthier, you live longer, you do much better. However, when the trials were conducted, and the trials they actually gave beta carotene supplements so that people were either not taking or not taking these beta carotene supplements. The opposite findings um, were found in the trials. Um, so actually they said that the beta carotene actually is harmful. It's actually almost, it's causing death. So has anybody any idea why we might get those two totally different findings here? Whether we use cohort studies where we're just watching people or randomised controlled trials where we're actually intervening and trying to um, give people supplements to make them you know, healthier, live longer, not have heart attacks. Any idea, anybody? Yeah, they're all they're all odd samples. I know. the 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 main The main thing is that the cohort studies are the people who are actually taking the, the beta carotene. So the people who voluntarily do all that stuff. And I think there's a there's a very good TED's talk by Ben Goldacre. He talks about this. They're the nerds. They're the people who jog and are healthy and eat healthily and do all the right things. They're the people. So. That's why you're getting this health. So they're self-selected because they're healthy people doing all the right things. So they're going to live longer. They're going to have better. So some people that come to talks like this, you know, they're going to be better, do better in terms of living a long time. However, the trials, you're giving, it's not a voluntary thing. You're either giving the supplement or you're not. So you've actually got a purer look at whether or not that supplement works, taking away everything else. So the trials are giving you um, a better result well, a more useful result. And it's helpful to know that if you're healthy and do all the right things that you do live, but I think we know that. <laughs> um, what we don't know is if you take a supplement, is it actually of any use? And it's actually not. I mean, it fits in with the vitamin pill finding as well. Just, just to give you an, an example of why you have to think about the design of what you're putting together in a systematic review. Um, so the results from the observational studies show considerable benefit whereas the findings from randomised controlled trials show an increase in the risk of death. So it's quite an interesting um, example, I think. Now, certainly in dentistry, which is the area I come from, um, you can't always look at randomised controlled trials. Um, and intervention studies aren't appropriate for looking at things like um, prognostic factors or looking at risks. So the first one there, might be to look at associations between gum disease and risk of heart disease, or low birth weight babies, or stroke, and you wouldn't be able to do that using randomised controlled trials. Because you can't randomise on some of these issues. Um, and some, sometimes randomised controlled trials aren't feasible. Um, for example, water fluoridation. This country has bits and pieces of fluoridation in this country. But it's difficult to randomise it because when you think about people living in a community, they're travelling outside that community, they're buying food from supermarkets that have different distribution centres. It's very hard to do a randomised control trial of water fluoridation. Um, even cluster randomised isn't that easy. Um, and there might be sort of very special areas like this one, effectiveness of physiotherapy, occupational therapy and speech pathology for people with Huntington's disease. Well... There aren't going to be lots of randomised controlled trials looking at that because you haven't got that many patients, so they're not going to be the trials. So sometimes you do have to look at other levels of evidence. Um, but I suppose the previous example is just a warning to be very careful if you do. So now we're looking at the search strategy. It needs to be as comprehensive as possible. We look at electronic databases. Um, the Cochrane Controlled Trials Register is the best clinical trials register in the world trials, it's better than Medline, um, and we actually send stuff through to Medline and they re-index um, because of our hand searching and stuff. Um, so Medline's just a bit behind it. It's, it's the best place to look for randomised controlled trials. It's, in this country, it's free access to the Cochrane Library and all these resources. In um, The only place where it's not is America. It's Bradley Mavon, you go to America and you can't access it. It's one of those not, in, not, not invented here syndrome. You know. um, 
reference list. So when you find a trial, you need to look for the references for that trial of any other trials that there might be that you've, you've missed. Um, hand searching journals, you might want to do some hand searching. Usually you want to do that going back in time because it's got everything's got better. So it'll be old journals where trials have been missed. Um, for Cochrane reviews, we include all languages because there are a sufficient number of people working in Cochrane across the world to get translations done. So we're able to include any language. Um, and you need to search for ongoing or unpublished studies. There are trials registers now of ongoing studies. You can have a look at the trials register. You can, um, something we're doing at the moment, I'm doing um, a review on fluoride varnish um, for preventing caries in children. And we're contacting the manufacturers of the varnish. Um, one of them's called Jurafat and the manufacturer's Colgate. So we're contacting these people to find out whether there are any unpublished studies. Um, that should be going into this review for completeness to try and avoid bias. Um, reporting bias, big problem um, in systematic reviewing. I mean, basically, we want to get everything, don't we? But it's very difficult to do that. Um, statistically significant positive results, they're more likely to be published, and that's called publication bias. They're more <laughs> likely to be published quickly because the journal, you know, if you, if you submit something to the BMJ or the Lancet and it's an interesting finding, they'll publish it. But if it's something that says actually it doesn't, there's no difference, or, you know, they're not interested in publishing it. So um, it's more likely to publish rapidly in a better journal, more likely to be published in English. So if you've got a positive finding, you're more likely to get it published in an English language journal. And if it's more likely to be cited by others, so that's citation bias. So there are all these biases there, um, and we try our best to minimize these biases. Um, but it's, it's difficult. Um, this is an example of publication bias. Um, this was a systematic review done on riboxetine, a third generation antidepressant. Um, there were 13 trials published with published and unpublished data. And 74 of the patient data was previously unpublished. At this review. We got it from the manufacturers. And riboxetine is, this was the conclusions of the systematic review. Riboxetine is overall an ineffective and potentially harmful antidepressant. And that was the conclusion of the review. And it contradicted the findings of all the previous reviews where they'd only considered the published data. So because we managed to get this unpublished data from the manufacturers, the conclusions about this drug changed significantly. So that's quite a powerful example, really, about, um, about the power of systematic review. We now also have, um, we have to register randomised control, or yeah, we, we have to, certainly because they're funded, they have to register for randomised control trials. In America, you have to register a tri trial, and if you don't register, and, and th these can be trials that are carried out anywhere in the world, um, if, if they, you don't register the trial before you recruit, they charge them $100,000 a day from the day they recruit the first patient. So they're fine, the company's fine that. And that can be a trial... An American trial that's conducted in India, it doesn't matter where it is, it still has to be registered on a website. So I think that's been a very positive thing. Um, and the Declaration of Health Inc. is a very old thing, and that did say that it should be registered. It's just taken a long time um, to come into being. Um, the, the other problem is, I mean, you might register the trial, but 50% of trials supporting drugs that are approved by the US Food and Drug Agency remain unpublished five years after drug approval. And that's still very worrying. We've still got a few very worrying things going on. Um, so even though it's registered, and even if they say they're going to publish it, it can be a huge time delay if they don't like the results. Um, this is just showing you, we're sort of talking about the process of doing systematic review. This is PRISMA. Um, PRISMA is a bit like CONSORT. If any of you are into randomised control trials, you know a little bit about CONSORT. Well, PRISMA is the equivalent of systematic reviews. Um, and actually, we've got the same thing in Cochrane, but um, we use the PRISMA flow diagram, and that just, it takes you through the process. So it's to do with how many records you've identified, how many you're screening. What we do is we look through, normally you get the abstracts and the titles. You look through those, and you filter out any that just are hopeless. So any that look as though they might be useful, you then get the full paper score. Um, so you almost have potentially eligible, and then you look at them carefully, and you're going to exclude a lot of them because they're not. Um, full text, 
get rid of a lot. And then you end up with the ones that are included. And some of them you'll just do a qualitative synthesis because you haven't got the data you want, but they still should be included in there. Um, so that there isn't something called outcome reporting bias. So you would still have them included, even if you couldn't use the data. And then there'll be the ones that are actually in the meta-analysis that actually are synthesizing the data. So the selection and data extraction process, um, it's you have a data extraction form independently by at least two reviewers, and then you'll compare your results to make sure that we're not getting any errors in there. And then four is the quality assessment of included studies. Um, once again, that's done by two people, and the results of it are reflected in the analysis. I mean, it's fine having, suppose you've got six trials for flossing, um, and they're all showing it works. But what you really want to know is, well, but what, how good are they? How good are those trials? So in a way, you have to have a, um, a sense of the quality of the trials with the results. You might have one trial that says it's fantastic, but unless you know something about the quality of that trial, it's not very helpful. In the past, people used composite scale, so they'd, they'd read a paper or read it about a randomised controlled trial, and they'd tick all these boxes and they'd say, right, that one scores 18 out of 24 this one only scores 6 out of 24, this one must be better quality. But that approach has become, is found to be very problematic. And so what we do is we look at individual components. And in a randomised controlled trial, they're how the randomization's been done, whether or not the patients are blinded, whether or not the person measuring the outcome assessment is blinded, and things like that. So our sort of, um, this is just to do with bias coming in, this is the sort of form that we fill in for risk of bias, which is our quality assessment for each trial. Mm -hmm. So this is one trial in the flossing review, actually. And these are the things that we look at. They're called domains. So we look at randomization, sequence generation. Because um, if you look at consort, you should say how the randomization was done. Um, we look at allocation and concealment, um, whether or not the allocation was concealed from everybody until just before the patient got it or even sometimes it can carry on being concealed, if the pharmacy deliver pots that are protein to bring into the room, just put the patient's name on. Um, blinding, as I said, blinding of the outcome assessor, blinding of the participants. Um, there, it, you can't really have blinding of people using floss or not, um, but you can have blinding of the people who are measuring the bleeding gums and things. Um, they can be blind, blinded. And we have um, incomplete outcome data. We need to know exactly how many subjects are lost in the study, and whether that's the same in both groups, whether it's likely to have a problem, cause a problem with the results, we need to think about that. Um, selective reporting, we need to make sure that the things that they say they're going to report on, they do. Ideally, you want a protocol of the study, um, but you, have, you have, rarely have that. In the future, we will have, with the trials registry, we will have that, but we haven't at the moment. Ideally, you want to make sure that the primary outcomes they said they were going to look at are reported and that they haven't just reported the ones that they find interesting or the ones that are showing a statistically significant difference, which I think in the past has happened a lot. Um, other biases. Um, I need an answer. I've only got this mark, isn't it? I'm sure it's I don't know. Anyway. Um, compliance was not assessed, breakdown by gender, not reported. I can't imagine that's desperately important for the whole stuff. Anyway. Um, I'm just going to see... Where I'm up to because I'll finish in. Oh, I'm fine. I'll finish in five minutes. I think. Okay. So this. Oh, I don't know whether those colours are showing up very well. No, not really. Well, um, the colours are awful. <coughs> the pluses are green, and the question marks are yellow, and the whatever they are are red. I can't see the symbol there. The minuses are red. It's not 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 good colouring at all. Um, but this is so. You had a look at how we assessed the um, domains, um, and that was actually the Finkelstein paper. And then for each study we do this. Um, so we've got an overall picture of, um, from that we'll be able to tell which studies are generally at low risk of bias, which are at questionable risk of bias, and which are at high. Um, and then the data is also presented in another way by, I mean, you can just see it a bit here. Uh, green would be 
low risk of bass, yellow would be unclear, and red would be high risk of bass. Um, so we do it for each of the domains there, across studies. Um, so it's just looking at it in a different way. Um, but that sort of summarises the um, evidence, um, but then can be used alongside the results to say how good the studies were. That's how we do it. I'm just going to show you this, just not to frighten you. This is actually what we end, this is actually what we're trying to get to. We're trying to get to a, something called a forest plot. A forest plot. Um, so for each study, we've got data. The data's plotted, and then we end up with a pooled estimate here in this diamond. Um, what I'll probably do is myself or one of my team will come and give a talk about meta-analysis, and that's all to do with this, and what this means, and what all this plot means. So I'm not doing it now because it's far too complicated for today. Um, but if you're interested, then come along. Um, so this was actually to do with flossing versus control. These are, um, and we're looking here at plaque, and these are the plaque indices and their means and standard deviations, how many patients there were, and this is all the data. But I'm not, it's just to visually show you what a, a forest plot looks like. Um, and we're going to see another one now. Um, this is the Cochrane Collaboration logo. Um, the Cochrane Collaboration um, the logo is very specific. What we have here is a forest plot, and there are studies here. Um, the first group were pregnancy and childbirth, and Ian Chalmers, Sir Ian Chalmers, who set up the Cochrane Collaboration in the UK, in Oxford. Um, he, it came from one of the early um, systematic reviews, and it was to do with corticosteroids, which they, which they were giving to women who went into premature labour. And... It showed, it, this diamond at the bottom summarises the results from each of these seven studies. As I said before, if the studies cross the line, then there's no significant difference. Um, if they're to the left of the line, then there's obviously a, there's a benefit to saving babies' lives. Um, so what this is showing is that, and the diamond is the pooled estimate, pooling all this data, and that's saying there's definitely, this definitely works. And it's a bit like the example I showed you before. There was a big delay in giving women these drugs um, until they did a systematic review and then it became common practice to use the drugs. So that's the logo of the Cochrane Collaboration. Um, it's an international organisation that aims to help people make well-informed decisions about healthcare by preparing, maintaining and promoting accessibility of systematic reviews of the effects of healthcare and interventions. It's independent. It, we're not allowed to have anything to do with drug companies or anything. So... That's why it's very powerful. It has it keeps the farmer out um, to try and get to the truth, to try and be unbiased. There's a there's a huge issue over tamoxifen, um, sorry, over um, Tamiflu um, that was actually stockpiled by the UK um, and a lot of money wasted, and that became quite a big issue for um, the Cochrane Review. Managed to get hold of a lot of unpublished data, and they actually found that it it hadn't it didn't work. And the government, this government, wasted an awful lot of money on stockpiling Tamiflu. It was um, a Channel Four. Um, there's a Channel Four thing that I've got the video somewhere, um, which um, Don Snow did. It's very, it's very good, very interesting. Um, and that was all to do with the, the reviews. Um, the Cock Collaboration is an enterprise that rivals the Human Genome Project in its potential implications for modern medicine. The Lancet. This is all systematic reviews. So this is all the power of systematic reviews. Um, further reading, there's a Cochrane handbook, um, it's all free, it's online. Um, this talk will be going on the website, so all these slides will be available. Um, there's also a very good book, I'm sure they'll be updating it soon, by Egger, um, which I I use that, I learned from using that probably. And I think I came into Cochrane in the 90s and I, I found that book very helpful. Um, and then Prisma, we're talking about Prisma, it's the same as Consort. If you go on the Equator website, it has all these... Um, ways of assessing different study types and, and prism is the one to, or you can go straight to it. That, um, well, I think that's it. <laughs>